Great to see you guys. Happy Easter. It is wonderful to see you. I don't know if you caught my favorite line right there, because we're talking about hope today. And by the way, for some of you, you've told me this is your 2024 so far. It looks just exactly like that, like you're being chased by ostriches, and then you have to figure it out. But he says, we're going to make it. We're going to make it. We're not going to make it. And if you're like me, that's pretty much every day for you. Like somewhere in your brain, you're like, we're going to be fine. We're going to be fine. Oh, no, we're not going to be fine. And so um, today we're going to talk about this idea of hope. And the opposite of hope is this idea of despair. It's the idea of um, just feeling hopeless, feeling despair. And, And when you feel that way, it's hard to keep going. And yet God uses the very thing that we think is there to hold us back in order to propel us forward. And so I want to talk a little bit about that. You know, years ago, um, I don't know where Sean sat. He was there for this excitement. Um, We took a youth trip, and the kids uh, were all jumping off this rock into a river. And it was like 12 foot high. And if you don't know this about me, uh, I'm not afraid. I love water. I'm not afraid of water at all. Barefoot water ski, all that stuff. You can drag me behind a boat and you know, fish with alligators around, I don't care, none of that, but I am terrified of heights, and heights bother me, a tall ladder bothers me, Um, God made me short, you know, that's why he says, lo, I am with you always, (laughs) so tall people, you know, anyway, um, so So we go to this thing, and the kids are all jumping off the rock, and so I went to go, I got in line, I was a little nervous, but I'm like, you know, I'm fine, until the kid in front of me like skidded to a halt, like ran and went, oh, oh, and, and then my brain said, you really shouldn't do this. And of course, everybody's like, go, go. So I ran, well, as much as I could run. And as I was getting ready to jump, my brain said, grab a hold of the rock. And so I reached back, which you're not supposed to do. Of course, that went great. And I pretty much bounced off the rock and fell into the water like a dork. And then everybody said, you got to go again, you got to go, you didn't really do it that time. I'm like, great. So I thought, I'm going to do it. So I got up, this time I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to yell, a manly yell, I'm going to, and jump over the rock, out of the rock and, and do it. And so that's what I did. I ran and I yelled, and I jumped off the rock. Well, I thought that's what I did. Somebody videotaped it, it was actually Sean's mom, and... Um, I've lost the video, thankfully, but apparently I did not yell like a man. I yelled like an eight-year-old girl, and I went off the rock, and they filmed it, and when I hit the water, everyone, including other tour groups that were with us, were laughing. Everyone was laughing, and I said, but I get credit, even with the girl yell for that one, and I am done. Because I realize that in my mind, because I constantly think what could go wrong when there's heights involved, and I don't know about you, for those of us who have trouble with heights, we always feel like somebody's pushing us off the cliff, and it's a lot like carrying around an anchor. And the truth is, for many of you, when it comes to life, the reason you're struggling with hope is because there's an anchor holding you. And Jesus came in order to get rid of the anchor of sin in our life. But it's not just sin. He also gets rid of the anchor of regret and of guilt and of shame and of so many things that the enemy will use to keep you back in the old way of living and to keep, as you go through life, you looking back and going, but, 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 that's who I am. And the enemy even tried to do that with Peter. And that's why in one of the stories that it tells, it says, go tell the disciples and Peter. And I love that, that Jesus, uh, uh, when, when the angels came, they basically, it was like God gave them a message, hey, tell the disciples, but make sure you go out of your way to let Peter know he's still part of the group. And the truth is, that's what God does with us. So today we're going to talk about three Easter reminders to hope, because I don't want you to be one of these people that all the time is thinking, we're not going to make it, we're not going to make it, you know. I want you to be the person who thinks, you know what, God, you're giving me hope in the middle of my struggle, in the middle of my trial. Because, listen, here's the truth for all of us. You are human. You may have not noticed yet, uh, 
but you are and everyone is, and you're going to struggle with all kinds of things as long as you're in this body. You are not in heaven yet. And so when you struggle, it's easy to become hopeless, to think, I'm not going to make it, but God wants to give you hope. And so we're going to talk about three things today. We're going to talk about how pain actually can lead us to blessings. That's what Rodney talked about a little earlier. We're going to talk about how waiting brings uncertainty and then talk about hope fulfilled. So number one, pain brings blessings. And all of you know that we love to seek pleasure. We love to seek relaxation, comfort, entertainment. We're Americans. We love entertainment, right? We love to be left alone. We hate pain. And so that's what happens in this story. When we look at the story of what Jesus did, Jesus knew Ahead of time, he was going to the cross, and he told the disciples, if you read scripture, over and over, he tells the disciples, and it's like they're sitting there like teenagers, looking at their parents going, uh-huh, 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 did you hear what I said? No idea. Uh-huh, uh-huh, clean your room. Okay, yeah, okay. You have teenagers? You, you had, you, it, the teenagers are laughing. Like it's not, just clean your room when you get home, your mom will be happy, they'll be your present. So here's what Jesus says to his disciples. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And this is the word where we get the word carpos. It's that idea of carpe diem. By the way, carpe diem should not be translated seize the day. It should be pick the day. But, you know, that sounds weird. So why would we say pick the day? Be like, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. What do you mean? Right? And so Jesus is saying, if he dies, what happens? Fruit. And then he says, anyone who loves their life will lose it. Anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. And here's the truth. The worst thing I could do jumping off a rock is reach back. And some of you have come out of all kind of issues, whether it's your childhood, whether it's your parents, whether it's mistakes you've made, dumb things that you've done. And if you're not careful, you will constantly look back at that and that will be your focus and that will be your anchor. And you will go through life going, this is who I am. This is who I am. Not realizing who Jesus is making you and how he's changing you and how he's working on you. You know, we talk about and we tell people this is the perfect church for imperfect people. But the truth is, it's not that that's our pursuit. (laughs) No one wakes up in the morning and goes, I really want to see how many dumb things I can do today. Now, granted, if you've been here to church, you recognize that it's a natural thing for me. It's just dumb things just happen. But the truth is that when we let the enemy put our past in our face all the time, when we allow the enemy to constantly remind us, now listen, I'm not talking about repentance because we need to repent of habits and hang-ups and hurts. I'm not talking about not, I'm not talking about looking back in order to fix where you are. But what I'm talking about is something you've already repented of, something you've already dealt with, something you've already apologized for or made right or forgiven or allowed God to forgive you and ask for forgiveness of other people, and yet you keep going back to it. The enemy does that just to make you hang on, to help you to become hopeless. In John chapter 19, if you want to know how serious Jesus was about this whole idea of pain, he says, finally Pilate handed him over to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. In all of history, crucifixion was one of the most ruthless deaths. One of the worst ways to die. And yet Jesus knew that in order to pay for sin, because none of us, can earn our way to God. None of us can do enough good things to earn God's love. We can never be perfect enough for God. So we needed a sacrifice that's very foreign to us as Americans. I mean, we go and buy our chicken. And if it has any fat on it, we freak out. 
We're not used to the idea of sacrifice. We're not used to the idea of pain in any part of our life. And yet, what did Jesus do? He paid the ultimate price between two thieves on a cross. Your past failures, your past hurts, the people who hurt you, if you focus on those things and don't die even to them, you will be caught up in your past. By the way, for some of you, it's been so long since you've laid down your pain before God. It's been so long since you've struggled with something and instead of saying, God, this is yours, you over and over say, I'm not going to make it, I'm not going to make it, I'm not going to make it. And the truth is, even in your pity, your focus is on you. I want to encourage you to take your focus off you and say, God, because you gave everything for me, I surrender everything to you. When's the last time you just surrendered everything to God? Is there a struggle you have today? Is there something you're worried about today? Is there a frustration in your life, a relationship that you're struggling with? Maybe it's a job situation or a work situation. Maybe it's a health situation. Have you said to God, you know what, God, regardless of what happens, I surrender that to you. Because too often we're, so li- we're living so much focused on ourselves and even focusing on our past sometimes can be selfish and self-centered. Instead of saying, God, I'm just surrendering all of that to you. My good, my bad. So when you find yourself saying, I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it. Then you can say, you know what, God, without you, I'm not going to make it. So I'm surrendering it all to you. By the way, one of the things you'll notice in that clip was in order for them to make it, they had to have a little less weight. And the very thing that was attacking them was the thing that was used to get them light enough to just barely make it. And the pain you're going through, the struggle that you're going through, that thing that you're dealing with may be the very thing that God's going to use to change you, to make you a different person, to make you more loving, more caring, more empathetic to others. Some of you are going through physical things that you think, why am I going through this? The truth is God can use that very specific thing you're dealing with for you to help somebody else. It could be that you're going to meet with somebody and just talk to them one day and say, I totally understand. And just like it says that Jesus sympathizes with our weakness, we can sympathize with the hurts of others and help to carry them. It may be the very thing that God uses not only to propel you but to propel others. I love Psalms 51. Psalms 51 is where David totally blew it, totally messed up, killed somebody, had them killed, ended up having Solomon out of wedlock. If you don't know, that's the part of the story. Psalms 51 is him confessing and saying, God, I'm unworthy. Would you purify my heart? And if you read to the end of Psalms 51, it's David realizing that once he lays everything at God's feet, he realizes that God will restore him. That's the truth for all of us, regardless of what you're going through. When you trust him, you go, God, you know what? You've got this. And with you, I'm going to make it. Painful times. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who died in Germany after his friends tried to keep him from going back to Germany from America. I was actually in Germany with my sweet, wonderful wife in a burned-out cathedral. In the middle of that burned-out cathedral was a plaque, and it was a quote by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Listen to what he says. I believe that God will give us all the strength we need to help us to resist in all times of distress, but he never gives it in advance, lest we could rely on ourselves and not on him alone. As Americans, you know, Jesus said, give us this day our daily bread. And I'm going to be talking about prayer next week, starting in our new series. But the truth is, we like to pray, God, give me my weekly, monthly, yearly retirement bread. I'd like to know what bread I have coming up, right? We, we look way ahead, but God only gives us grace for today. And if you're looking and saying, am I going to make it? I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to. If you're looking way down the road and, and you're asking God for grace for that, you're not there yet. He gives you grace for today, for this moment. Some of you don't know the answer to what's next. Guess what? You haven't turned the page yet. God knows what's on the next page. So you have to say, God, I'm going to trust you with the next page. 
And the answer could be, but I don't like what God is doing. Yeah, Jesus didn't either. And I don't either. Sometimes I'm like, God, I don't get this. But I can look back at where God has taken me. And can I promise you something? That God has been good every single day. Number two, listen to this. Waiting brings uncertainty. What do you do when suffering won't stop? What do you do when you're tired of waiting for an answer? Can, can I tell you how I grew up in Miami? My dad was not only an impatient person, he was the world's most impatient driver. I get it naturally. I'm at least three generations of impatient drivers. There's a story about my grandfather on the way to church cussing a guy out before air conditioning in a car, if that'll tell you how long ago it was, cussing a guy out, pulling into the church parking lot to where the guy pulled in behind him because he was also going to church. Did I mention my grandfather was a deacon at that church? Probably should have added that to the story. So I can remember sitting in my dad in Miami traffic. If you haven't enjoyed the, the joy of Miami traffic, if you want to test to see if you're a real Christian, go to Miami and drive. And so we would be turning left at rush hour and the, the lights were timed purposefully so that at certain times in rush hour, that left turn light did not even turn green. And so you'd watch the cars go past and you sat at a light and you sat at a light and you sat at a light. And then finally, the person in the front, it was time to go and you were 30 cars behind them to turn left. And every single time that light would turn green and my dad would go one, two, and he would count every single time the number of cars that went through and guess what his son does to this day one it's a guy on his phone what's the deal and god purposefully just gave me a car with the worst horn i've ever heard it sounds like the road runner people laugh when i go out of the way me 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 they put it in reverse and no i'm just kidding but that's how I grew up. No patience. I, I'm waiting for the next things. And some of you are the same way. Like you're looking at me like, I never do that in traffic. Now at Publix, I count the line. And you look to see who's in line with you at Publix. And if they get out first, you lost. You ever do that one? I should have gotten that line. You ever do this? Should have got, you ever look at the different lines and then pick one and then see if you're winning? Right? That's how impatient we are. And so when it comes to real things in life, things that matter, we're even worse. And what are we? We're frustrated. We're irritated. We're aggravated. Why? Because we think, I don't know if I'm going to make it because I'm having to wait to get an answer. Listen to what happens. Early on the first day of the week, John 20, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple. The one that Jesus loved. By the way, that's John talking about himself. I love how John's just like, you know, the disciple Jesus loved. It's all through the book of John, by the way, which is awesome. Like John's writing, he's like, you know, the one that Jesus loved. You guys have brothers and sisters, right? You know how that is. All right. So anyway, so, so the one who Jesus loved and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. Now listen to what she says. And we don't know where they have put him. What's she saying? Even though they were there and heard Jesus over and over say, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise again, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise again. They were teenagers. Clean my room. Okay. And they had no idea. The night of the Lord's Supper, they're fighting over who's the greatest. They were the Muhammad Ali's of their time. If you got that joke, you showed your age. And other people were like, who's Muhammad Ali? Oh, I know, I know. What's going on? And by the way, when life isn't giving us answers, we tend to assume the worst, don't we? We're in the air. I'm not going to make it. When the doctor says, I need to see you next week, we assume the worst. We, we think through. And, and actually, we do better once we know an answer, even if the answer's not great. Why? Because we hate waiting. And so she says, we don't know where he went. Well, he told you where he went. Well, we weren't paying attention. And so she doesn't know, so she's freaked out. And that's how we all are in the times of waiting. Even if we know that God said, I will never leave you or forsake you, we're like, but where are you? He's like, I will never leave you or forsake you, but I'd like to know right now. 
Um, did I mention the I'll never leave you or forsake you part? In John 10, 10, this is what happens to our life. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. And this word have it to the full means that they can hold on to life. That you'll have a real life. The enemy comes to try to steal it. He comes to get you distracted. To get you, fr- you ever get frustrated about something you can do nothing about? Did you watch the news this week? Have you written down yet what you're supposed to be angry about today? Have you, have you written down what you're supposed to be scared about today? By the way, every week, start making a list. I'm, this week, I'm supposed to be... Every week, they have to change it because we don't pay attention if they tell us more than two weeks. So, so what are you supposed to be scared about? What are you supposed to be angry about? Why do they do that? Because the enemy wants to steal every day from you by getting you thinking about, we're not going to make it. We're not going to make it. I have a good friend who posted about, yesterday, he posted about the Saturday before Sunday at Easter and how it was a time of waiting and a time of hurting and a time of uncertainty. And when he posted it, I realized that a lot of people haven't known him as long as I've known him. 25 years ago, we went to seminary together. And he was coming home one day after work, and he got off work early from a church he was working at. He was leading the music at a church, a church music pastor, and he left work early. And as he went home, there was a truck in his driveway, and his wife was cheating on him. And he caught her. And so he went to the church and said, I caught my wife cheating on me. And they said, oh, that's too bad, you're fired. And they laid him off. And he didn't know what he was going to do, so for a while he sold cars and furniture and all kind of stuff, just trying to find jobs and didn't know what was going to happen with his kids and everything else. And I look at his life now, and I say, look what God did. Even through all that pain, all that struggle, he's a music minister again, he's a minister at a church again, he's got his kids with him, God is blessing him, God has given him a new wife and changed his life, and yet on that Saturday he had no idea what was going to happen next, and yet God has blessed his life because he was faithful in those times of uncertainty. Listen, if you will surrender your will to God during times of uncertainty... If you will say, God, I don't know what the answer is, but I'm going to be obedient to you during this time of questioning, then God will bless you in the next answer. I talked to somebody in our church just a few weeks ago who was getting laid off, and they didn't know what they were going to do. They said, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm praying about it. And I said, well, I don't know what you should do either, but I'm going to pray for you. And this morning she said, by the way, the next business that took over that business wants to hire me and put me in charge. Now, only God can do that. Number three. Hope fulfilled brings joy. You ever lose your way? I went on the Appalachian Trail one time and got lost. You ever done that? That's fun. We were on the Appalachian Trail. I was there with Kyle, and we were following the trail, and we followed the trail, and all of a sudden, I looked up. And if you don't know this about the Appalachian Trail, there's little white marks on the trees that tell you that you're on the trail. And we were going down this path, and all of a sudden, I looked up, and I didn't see any marks. And I went, oh, no. I'm with a 10-year-old in the middle of nowhere with nothing but a bottle of water. Oh, no. So I said, well, let's follow it back. So we started going back up the trail. Nothing, 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 nothing. Seemed like forever. And then all of a sudden, you know what happened? All of a sudden, I saw a white mark on the tree. We had taken a wrong turn and gotten off the trail. And I got back on that trail. Can I tell you two things? Number one, I was so excited. I was like, oh, it's the best day ever. Number two, can I tell you that I looked a lot more often for those little white marks? Like all the time? Like, am I still on track? Here's the thing, when God answers a prayer, all of a sudden you recognize what he's walked you through. Some of you right now are in the time of darkness, the time of difficulty, the time of doubting. But I want to encourage you, hang on, keep following him, and he will open the doors for you. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he said these things to her. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came, stood among them, and said, Peace be with you. 
After he said this, he showed him his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And here's what's crazy. Thomas wasn't there. So for the next week, Thomas went through life going, you guys are a bunch of liars. And he, during that time, basically said to them, we're not going to make it. We're not going to make it until Jesus came and said to him, hey, uh, <clears throat> you want to see my hands? And that's when Thomas realized, I should have believed what he said. And the truth is, when you're going through a time of doubting, even when your friends are praying for you, even when your pastor says it's going to be okay, hang in there. It's easy to start to think, we're not going to make it. But can I tell you, if you'll hang on, one day joy will come. And God will even use the difficulty you're going through now in order to make you a different person. In order to bless you in some way you could never think about. God will use that. By the way, your worst physical health day on earth is going to have the best ending ever. Because one day you're going to go, I'm so sick, I feel like I might die. I told my wife, my tombstone's going to say, I told you I was sick. Right? And one day you're going to say, I feel so sick, I think I'm going to die. And you're going to close your eyes and you're going to open them and Jesus is going to be there. That's the worst day. And the truth is, we have the hope of heaven no matter what happens. The final verse, Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. It doesn't say that everything that happens to you is good. It doesn't say that everything that happens to you is perfect, but it says that God will even work out those bad things, those, those wrong things, those people that hurt you. He will even work that out for your good if you'll trust him. I want to ask you a question. Are you carrying around an anchor of guilt and shame and sin and frustration and discouragement today? Maybe today you just say, God, I'm just handing all of that to you. God, I don't know what to do about this. I'm not smart enough. And God says, finally, if you need to hand something to him today, do that. Maybe you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. I'd love to talk to you after the service about what it means to be a Christian. To surrender your life to him knowing that Jesus, this is what we celebrate today, he died for our sins and we believe he rose again. That's what separates Christianity from every other religion. Our Savior is alive and because of that, because he lives, the Bible says we can face tomorrow. We surrender our lives to him and the Bible says he takes our sin and gives us his righteousness so that you can have a relationship with God. If you want to do that, I'd love to talk to you after the service. We're going to have our time of offering in just a second. A great song to close our service, but we're going to pray. So would you join me? Father, thank you for each one. We thank you for this Resurrection Sunday, for this Easter Sunday. May we remember the new life that you've given. May we leave those anchors behind during the time of waiting today. I know there's some here who are overwhelmed. Lord, would you give them your strength? Would you let them know that you're with them? Would you by your spirit? Just revive their hearts and minds. Lord, I pray too that folks who are discouraged would, would be, Lord, that some encouragers would come around them that would inspire them. Lord, bless each one today. May they know the hope that comes in you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to have our time of offering. Here's a great song to close our service. Thanks for coming.